This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Spring is coming, and that means a whole new line of clothes in stores for the spring season. But those latest trends aren't often designed with all body types in mind. When you shop, is it easy or difficult to find clothes that fit? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. Today, we talk about size inclusivity in the fashion industry. Vogue Business reported that leading retailers and brands, including Walmart and athleisure giants Nike, Puma, and Adidas, have all developed plus-sized lines. Yet it was universal standard, according to Vogue, that took size inclusivity to a new level, selling clothes from double zero to size 40. Coming up, we hear from Universal Standard co-founder Alex Waldman. If 7 out of 10 American women are a size 14 or larger, why aren't more fashion brands designing clothes for them? Joining us now on Zoom is John Luca Russo, who's a fashion journalist and author of Power of Plus. This is a book looking at the evolution of the plus size fashion movement, that book coming out in the summer. John Luca, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me here to chat. So I mentioned the average size of American women today. So this is a big opportunity for designers. So what's the issue, John Luca? Yeah, well, I think the issue is that there are multiple issues and it's not just one problem that can be solved, but there's really multiple layers of stigma and of design issues and of all these different things kind of working against designers. Um, and so, of course, there's kind of the stigma attached to larger bodies and the fact that for so long, fashion has been operated by this thin ideal that has been so prevalent throughout the industry. And for many, that's kind of remained prevalent till today. So that's, of course, a huge issue in and of itself. Then, of course, of course, there are other issues when it comes to actually designing. Of course, taking the leap into doing extended sizes is a huge financial investment. There's many layers in the, involved when it comes to nailing fit and design and figuring out marketing and all these different things that are so different from what designers and brands have done for years that making that leap, even though it can be profitable, there is a huge chance for failure. And I think a lot of designers we're seeing are still hesitant to take that leap even though we now have so much data that shows how prevalent this customer is and how ready she is to be served. Uh, I mentioned you're a fashion journalist. So tell us about you know, what led you to focus on this part of the fashion industry, including the, your book coming out. Yeah, absolutely. I actually started when I started journalism in entertainment. And when I was there, I was doing, you know, diversity reporting and entertainment, writing about the lack of plus size people in Hollywood. And it was really moving. And at the time I was writing for Teen Vogue um, and it was a really great time. But I'd always wanted to break into the fashion industry. I just never thought that my voice played a role there. And I, I couldn't find where that could intersect until the time came when Teen Vogue really went through this revolution and opened up the doors for that conversation to happen. And when that time came, I saw all this coverage start to come out about plus size fashion. And it was just a brand new world to me, something that I had never really been exposed to, um, especially as someone who has always kind of shopped on the menswear side of things where plus has never been a priority. Um, it was something I didn't know anything about. And so when Team Vogue kind of made this shift, it was the new hot thing that I wanted to dive into. And thankfully, I was able to very early in my career. And then I spent a good five years just digging solely into this market, into this community, learning about what size inclusivity really means, what inclusivity really means at its core. Um, and then I was able to kind of take that five years of experience chatting with everyone in this industry and, and really figuring all this out and turn it into this book that's a celebration of how far we've come, of the women who have brought this to life, but also kind of a reality check of how far still we have to go. And so that's what I, I hope the uh, people take away from the book is, you know, there's a lot to celebrate, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So let's always keep the momentum going. And John Luca, when we talk about how um, plus size fashion has evolved, can you give us a timeline and, and how it has changed in the last few decades? Absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of people think of plus size fashion as starting 
when kind of social media erupted, right? They think of Ashley Graham and these amazing trailblazers. Um, but the origins of plus size fashion go back to the 1900s, really. And of course, we could trace it back to the start of Lane Bryan in 1904 and kind of the evolution from there. Um, I think we saw a lot of momentum in the 80s and 90s with kind of the rise of the first curvy supermodels there. You had people like Emmy and Kate Dillon and these people who under today's standards were not plus size, but of the 80s and 90s were considered plus size um, and who really started to blaze a trail in places like Vogue. And so there you really had a lot of momentum building and, and there was just more of a community aspect because of these models. But things really picked up more steam, I would say, in the you know 2000s until now during the digital age when we could really connect because before this you know there were of course plus size women who existed in the 1900s but it was like one person in a family right or one person in a town there was no real connection between them and so with the digital age with the rise of blogs and live journal and tumblr and eventually instagram and digital shopping and all of this this customer became undeniable. She was not only there and ready because of how confident she had become through people like Ashley Graham and Precious Lee and all these iconic models, but now she was connecting directly with other women across the country in her exact same space. And so that connection built the community at a faster pace than we'd ever seen to the point now where that will never die down. It's only building year after year as women continue to rise in sizes year after year. And so I think now it's kind of undeniable, whereas in the 1900s, it was kind of easier to ignore because there was no real way for them to band together and use their voices as one, whereas nowadays we have that opportunity. I think about uh, people like Lizzo, uh, who has championed inclusivity for years. I just wanted to play uh, this clip where she's speaking to fans. Let's hear it. I want you to know that I love you very much and I'm very proud of you. I want you to know if you can love me, you can love your goddamn self. And if you don't mind, I'd like to do a little mantra with you. I want you to go home tonight and look in the mirror and say, I love you, you are beautiful, and you can do anything. I really want you to say that because I believe we can save the world if we save ourselves first. Jean-Luc, I wanted you to respond to that Lizzo mantra and, again, how celebrities like her have, have really also helped raise awareness about this. I think what Lizzo has done and what others in similar positions have done have not only helped in propelling this movement to a new level, but in giving permission to especially young girls and young people in difficult positions to live their authentic selves and to step into their power because I think for so long society has told them otherwise. And that's why I think someone like Lizzo is so important because not only is she a walking example of true representation and the power that comes from that, but she is welcoming a new generation into being who they are and embracing that and not just embracing it, but celebrating it so publicly. And I think sometimes because of the stigmas and discrimination that are so rampant in society today, you need someone who can just give you that permission to do so. You need someone who's just going to push you just a little to where you can accept yourself and you can kind of push that boundary because it's hard to do so alone and i think now that we have those celebrities and those models really rising and, and being so open and honest and transparent about this issue i think we're seeing so many people be able to really step into their own and i think that's the most exciting thing right because i think there's so much trauma attached to this topic there's so much discrimination there's so much to rework in our mind and sometimes we just need someone to hold our hand through it and i think celebrities like lizzo are helping people do that you're hearing John Luca Russo here on Where We Live, a fashion journalist, author of the forthcoming book, Power of Plus, looking at the plus size fashion movement out this summer. As we talk about size inclusivity, uh, coming up, we're going to hear from the co-founder of Universal Standard, Alex Waldman. But John Luca, I wanted to pick up uh, where you left off. And listeners, we'd love to hear from you, too, about your experiences uh, shopping, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. But you had mentioned about the toll that this takes on people. And so let's break that down a little about what it's like to go into a store. And when you're not able to find clothes in your size, you know, how that impacts people. Yeah, well, it all goes back to this feeling of being othered, 
right? And being the other in a group. And I've heard from so many people, and this was my experience too growing up, where you would go shopping with your friends at the mall, which is such a common thing, right? And you would have to stand outside the dressing room while they try things on and wait for them because nothing was available in your size. And it's something that's ingrained in us so early on in life. And that's such a huge part of the problem and why the problem is systemic, because it's something that we learn before our minds are fully developed, before we go through puberty, before we even understand really what's happening. We're learning subconsciously that our bodies are a problem here, right? Like our bodies are different. And because they're different, they're wrong in a way, because society has told us that different is bad. And so that is kind of the message that we've continued to be fed. And I think it's still fed today to the next generation to, you know, not as bad as it was in the past, but I think it's still so prevalent today among Gen Z and among the younger generation. Um, and, but I think it's, you know, it's so painful at times, right, to always be the other, to always be viewed as different. And even when the people around you might not express them, well, they might make you still feel included internally, you'll feel that way still because that's what society has been feeding you. And because our minds become so trained to think in this way, to think that being plus size or bigger or curvy or whatever we want to call it, to think that that's wrong, to that's a human flaw and that that's our fault for being that way, to live that way, we have to reframe our entire mindset. And that's one of the most difficult things to do. That's why I think this conversation around body positivity needs to change to being more about a journey, right? A lifelong journey, because there's no easy switch to suddenly being confident. You can't just, you know, hear one of Lizzo's songs, for instance, and automatically feel 100% because not even Lizzo feels 100% all the time, right? As she's been very open about. And so I think that's the thing. It's like, it takes so long to get to the point of, feeling that pain of being plus size in a thin only world and it's going to take so long to rework that and fight against it and so how are we seeing brands respond so when we think about what uh, plus size uh, fashion is or the fact that there's that you know section uh, in the store if people are still buying clothes uh, uh, in uh, physical locations, John Luca. But this idea that if you're plus size, okay, well, here's black, here are dark colors, here's something that's baggy. You know, how, how is that changing? Yeah, I think, you know, in some ways it's changing, in some ways it's not. I hate being like realistic when I give this answer, but I think it's important to recognize where we're at. I think we're seeing a rise in brands who are really catering not only to this market, but to this community. And I think that's what's exciting because they're investing in the community. They're reaching out to these women, they're consulting with them, they're bringing them behind the scenes and they're figuring out what exactly this community wants, right? Which is not those same matronly dresses, it's not the boring black and white, but it's real fashion and it's the same fashion that people who wear straight sizes already have access to. And so I think brands like that are really starting to understand who this customer is and, and really how she's not that different. I mean, there are, of course, ways that she's different, but at her core, what she wants is the same, and right, that same is equality. And so the same thing that her straight size counterpart wants. I think on the other side, we're still seeing brands who say they want to invest in plus, but really what they're doing is, you know, making it that very small section that they put in the back that is always boring, that is never appealing. It's not what the customer wants. It's just so that they can say, oh, we did plus and like, hopefully it works. If not, it fails and we'll cut it. And they don't really make an investment in the community. And I think differentiating between investment in market and community is important because I think especially for the plus size space, that community element is so vital. And I think brands are starting to understand that and really they're tapping into it because the community has spent so long having these conversations internally. We've spent so long talking about it online, in person with each other, that we now have such a wealth of knowledge about what plus size women want right now, that it would be crazy not to take advantage of that and to reach to the community and to really understand it because going another way is just not a smart decision. Um, so we're seeing brands do that more and kind of understand the value there. I think that's what's most exciting is seeing brands tap into the community element here because I really think that's at the foundation of what plus size fashion is. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. And, you know, one more question for you, John Luca, before we head to break. And I definitely want to get to listener calls as well. But when we think about size inclusivity, so what does that mean? You know, what when we think about the range of sizes that should be offered? 
Yeah, that's a hard question. I don't think there's one solid answer for it. I think there's a lot of debate around this topic of, you know, what does it mean if you say you sell plus sizes? Or what does it mean if you say you're size inclusive? Because I think a lot of brands will say they're size inclusive and then they'll go up to a 24 or a 28, which is an extended size range, right? But it neglects still women who are above a size 28. So is that really size inclusive as a whole? No. And so I think it's a hard answer. I don't know if there's one solid term. I think the term size inclusive has become the go-to for a lot of people. I prefer when people say we sell extended sizes zero through 24, 28, 32, 40. Um, I think when people list what the range is, it's kind of better because you're upfront about it. Um, Because I think a lot of people, unfortunately, as body positivity has become so commercialized, have really capitalized off this topic of size inclusivity. Um, So it's hard to tell. I always prefer the term extended sizes and then for people just to list what the sizes are. Um, But I think we're always talking about sizes that are above a 14 um, and that are hopefully a 14 to 40. Um, And then size inclusive would include the straight size of the spectrum as well. So it would include the zero to 14 as well. So size inclusive should mean the whole thing, not just plus, not just straight size. It should mean the whole spectrum. Gianluca Russo, again, is a fashion journalist, author of the book Power of Plus, coming out in August, examining the plus-size fashion movement. Coming up after the break, we're going to learn how fashion colleges are including subjects like size inclusivity. We're going to hear from Universal Standard co-founder. And if you're on hold, stay with us. We'll take your call right after a short break. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Seven out of 10 American women are size 14 or larger. If that's you, do you still shop in stores or are you discouraged by the lack of options grouped in the plus size section? You can join us, 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Coming up, we're gonna hear how fashion colleges approach size inclusivity in their curriculum. My next guest co-founded a fashion brand that offers all of its clothes in sizes double zero to 40. Universal Standard co-founder Alex Waldman writes in Vogue, fashion still divides everyone into groups based on their dress size, an antiquated practice that results in a lack of access to clothing and two very different retail realities. Alex Waldman joins us now on Zoom. Welcome to our show. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. So tell us about you know when you started Universal Standard and why, Alex? Well, we started Universal Standard and we were very much uh, the only ones in this space to do what we were doing. We wanted to create a brand that catered to women um, and that that was the only sort of definition of of the brand that we were building. Um, So we started with a certain size range and then we built out on both sides. Um, to create a brand that caters to women double zero to size 40, which is the largest commercially available size range in the world. And we make everything in every single size. Um, We wanted to create a brand that um, would set an example and show people who weren't certain whether this could be done properly or not, um, that indeed it could. And what has been the response? You know, we heard John Lucas say earlier, you know, maybe the the better approach is to offer extended sizes instead of grouping into uh, the so-called plus section, uh, Alex. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, I once made a very controversial comment that said plus size was over, um, you know, which was, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people kind of reacted to it. I think that as long as you're the the, the other, uh, you're going to be the lesser. And I very much agree with John Luca on that. Um, so the idea that we take away these titles and these sort of specialty categories, which no longer have any real relevance, you can't be a specialty category when you represent 70% of American women. Um, 
I think that, you know, when you start talking about just clothing for women, that's when that's when things settle into the right place. It's the way it's always should have been. Uh, but unfortunately, it hasn't been. And, uh, and we are now building a world where this kind of cultural change, it's not a fashion change, it's really truly a cultural change um, is taking place. I wanted to fit in some callers now. You can join us, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Chase is calling in from Suffield. Chase, are you there? I am here. <laughs> what did you want to share with us? I really just want to thank Alex and Universal Standard for basically existing. I, I'm literally sitting here in head-to-toe Universal Standard clothing, as I do almost every day, actually, um, because their clothing is so beautiful and it fits and it's given me the ability to express a, a style and aesthetic in a way that I've never really had that option before. And I honestly, I never get more compliments from people about my clothing than when I am wearing universal standard clothing. And it's, you know, I, I know I sound like an ad right now, but it literally fits me <laughs> for my whole life, you know, casual work. I'm an attorney. Um, and I, I often find myself reaching for those pieces daily. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, before we hear from Alex, I just wanted to ask Chase, you know, what led you to Universal Standard? What was your experience in the traditional store? Yeah, I mean, I, I had gained some weight and I was having a hard time shopping in stores, as I think a lot of people who are larger find that, that it's difficult to go into a store and find pieces off the rack. And I happened to see an ad, I think maybe on Facebook at some point in time, and I looked at it and said, well, what's this about? And wasn't sure. And you know, I, I'm hooked, um, and it's, it's really just opened up a whole world of, of fashion for me. Alex Waldman, did you want to respond to Chase? I mean, it is such a complete pleasure to hear that. Um, first of all, thank you for dialing in and saying all those wonderful things. Um, this is exactly why we do what we do. We create clothes for women who um, you just don't need to define themselves in any other way, but as women who like clothes um, and, you know, remove all those other obstacles that seem to be in the way when um, you go shopping in your larger body. Um, this is, this is a way of leveling the playing field and hopefully showing to the entire industry that it can not only just be done, but be done very well. And that there is definitely an appreciative customer at the end of it. Again, you can join us, 888-720-9677, as we talk about size inclusivity and how fashion brands, uh, some are more, being more responsive than others, including Universal Standard, which was founded by Alex Waldman, and a co-founder back in 2015. Again, the number, 888-720-9677. Janelle's calling in from Danbury. Janelle, what did you want to share? Hi. Uh, thank you for having this program today. Um, I am a middle-aged plus-size woman and single and uh, living in the suburbs. Um, I find it really difficult to find outfits that make me feel sensual, make me feel sexy. Um, I happen to be in the arts and I live a young life, but uh, oftentimes when I go into the stores, uh, I think there are a lot of outfits that are available for uh, the younger generation, which is great. Like, I love the stores like Torrid um, and the other stores that are catering to the younger ones. But, you know, when I go to look, um, I would like to feel sexy and sensual without wearing a crop top at age 52. And um, I just find that that's still really difficult uh, where I live right now. I know that one of the department stores... The plus size section is down in the basement in the corner, back in the corner. They moved it, actually. It didn't used to be there, but now that's where it is. Um, and, yeah, so I think that um, as a middle-aged woman, I feel that I still have a lot of difficulty finding clothing when I actually go into the stores to purchase. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Janelle, for calling in uh, to share uh, your perspective uh, here with us. Uh, Alex, uh, you know, Janelle talks about the, the, the plus size section being in the basement or in the corner. And we brought this up with John Luca earlier about, you know, the toll that it takes on people when they are relegated to, you know, not very many options. And, you know, it's not something that they get excited about, that they can't wear these kinds of trends and colors and that they see others uh, in. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I think uh, this is a, a very real and very familiar problem. Um, as long as you're the other, you're always going to be the lesser. That's why it's so important uh, to set an example and say, you know, everyone can wear everything um, and let the consumer decide what they want. Um, you know, just put the care into making it um, and they will come. You know, if you build it, they will come. Um, I think that um, the caller's reflections are very uh, apt and very true. It is very difficult to go out there. Uh, if you're a woman in your 50s and you don't want to wear a crop top, you know, it's very difficult to go out there and find something that makes you feel the way you want to feel. That's why it's so important that other brands take up this mantle and start diversifying the options that are out there for for people this is one of the biggest goals we have as a brand we make ourselves entirely available and as much as i love universal standard i want to be able to walk into other stores and request my size um, this is a cultural change that is taking place and it's happening perhaps a little bit, bit more slowly than we would like but it is happening and there are brands out there that are really stepping up and taking on various categories for um, various ages and, and a number of different looks. Um, it's still slim pickings, but it is definitely moving in the right direction. And there are plenty of brands out there now that are really starting to pay attention to a much broader uh, aesthetic for women of all ages. What are the obstacles for getting more brands to embrace size inclusivity? I'm looking at that uh, same Vogue business article that you were quoted in that also talks about the higher manufacturing costs of plus size apparel and how that can set back investment for the future. So explain how Universal Standard makes your clothing. Well, we started as a brand with the goal of making clothing across a very large size range. That um, helps tremendously. When you are a brand that is already established as a quote unquote straight size brand and you have to make the foray into larger sizes, it's a more complicated process because everything is already established and you have to, in a way, learn a whole new way of making clothes um, that take up more material and perhaps need a higher degree of um, knowledge in terms of you know, how to engineer the clothing. It's an investment. What we are saying is that it is absolutely an investment worth making in your brand because this is the future of clothing. It is the future of culture. It is inclusive and it has, you know, it, it's got to be much more far reaching than it has been until now. There are real obstacles, but they are completely, um, overcomable if i can put it that way um and you you just need to have the desire um to do so which i think is becoming more and more obvious to more and more brands and i mentioned that you were you found, co-founded your brand in 2015 so you found a way and when you think about the price point um you, you found a good place uh, to handle the investment but also make getting a return alex yeah absolutely because the customer is there um, and, you know, it is undeniable. You cannot have a specialty category with 70% of American women in it. It makes absolutely no sense. And you can then no longer have an industry that complains about, you know, its lack of robustness. Um, you can't ignore 70% of consumers who are, by the way, not just buying for themselves, but for other people in their lives when they come to your store, whether it's a, an actual store or a direct-to-consumer website, um, it's just impossible to, to build a road forward 
um, without including so many people. You're hearing Alex Waldman here on Where We Live, co-founder of Universal Standard, a women's clothing brand that is the most size inclusive brand in the world, offering sizes double zero to 40. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. A Jackie wrote on Facebook, it's been my experience that more expensive designer lines offer more generously cut clothes. The fabrics are more supple and flexible so that the clothes fit and drape my body more comfortably. And with less expensive clothes, Jackie writes, my size fluctuates between 14 or 16. Um, She's opted to buy fewer pieces for her business wardrobe to afford a more comfortable and flattering fit. But this inequity is so frustrating. Alex, can you speak to that and also the choices in um, the the fabric uh, that you use for your clothes? It doesn't always have to be the spandex that people might think of when we think of um, accommodating larger sizes. No, absolutely not. But ironically, that is not the problem. The problem is the lack of spandex. (laughs) Uh, sorry, I have a dog here. <laughs> um, the problem is that most people will will buy things that do not have in them the the type of stretch and the type of. I'm so sorry. That's I- okay. Um, while you while you tend to your pop, uh, Jean Luca Russo is still here with us. Jean Luca, did you want to respond to that that comment from our Facebook listener? Yeah, well, I'll say that it's a completely understandable thing. But at the same time, I think it's important to recognize that, you know, brands that put more time into fit, which is a long process in getting different fit models to try their clothings on and, and making that investment. And then, of course, when it comes to kind of the quality of things and the time, um, it's going to be of a higher price point. And I think we've kind of been conditioned by this world of fast fashion to think that fashion should be cheap and easy and all of that. Um, but I think when things cost less, there's often a reason for that, right? There's less of an investment made so they can charge less and still make money, whereas the opposite is true for something that's going to fit you better and it's going to last longer. Um, And I think as we pivot to a more sustainable model, I think recognizing that and understanding that you can buy, you know, five pieces for your wardrobe and style them in different ways, um, and that can work perfectly. And that will cost the same as you buying, you know, one new piece every week that's of a cheaper brand that is going to fall apart, that isn't going to be, you know, fitting you as well. That's not going to be as nice quality. Um, And so I think a lot of it is a kind of our mental shift as well. And of course, I'm sure as how Alex will explain the design perspective there. But from a consumer perspective, I think that's um, part of the issue, just kind of reframing our mindsets to think that, you know, maybe we don't need a hundred new things every day that are not of great quality, but investing kind of those key pieces that are going to fit us better because there's more an investment in them, I think is a better way to approach um, shopping in general. Mm. You know, we wanted to hear the perspective of how fashion colleges are including subjects like size inclusivity as part of their core curriculum. Uh, Joining us now on Zoom is Kenlyn Jones, who's assistant professor at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Kenlyn, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. So tell us about um, how you began teaching students about size inclusive fashion and what are you hearing from them? Yes, so I teach in the fashion design department at Massachusetts College of Art and Design. And, you know, we're dedicated to access and inclusion and diversity and representation. You know, it's kind of part of our core mass art mission. Um, But in the fashion design department, I noticed there was a real gap in educating for all sizes. So I wanted to pursue that because it's it's something very personal to me as well. I couldn't, you know, see my own size in a store. And it was heartbreaking to see these students design for an ideal body type that didn't even represent them. So working on um, showing them how to size their designs appropriately and to represent all customers, especially because like Alex said, 70%, so a majority of the US American customer, uh, female customer is uh, above a size 14. 
We heard from Elizabeth on uh, Facebook. Uh, she writes, the latest season of Project Runway have included various size models, and it's been interesting watching the designers often struggle to consider the different proportions, and some have suffered critique. They were not prepared in their formal design training to deal with this subject. So, uh, so Kenlin, I'd love to hear your response to that and, as, and the work that you're doing uh, to prepare students with this idea. Absolutely. We really want inclusive design uh, to be thought of not as an addition, but as a something that's been holistically integrated. And proportion is a huge part of that. Oftentimes you'll see major brands make the mistake of sizing up everywhere or not thinking of where a person might hold a little bit more weight or need a little bit more stretch or room. Um, so I was able to bring in two plus size dress forms, which is not a lot, but it is a start um, as the recipient of the DIA co-inclusive by design education fund, um, which was a collaboration between the council of fashion designers and uh, DIA and co. And that money was raised because Lizzo uh, had raised money at the curvy con. Uh, so bringing in, experts and also bringing in the tools and educational materials we need to show students how to draft a pattern for a larger size or to make adjustments, fit adjustments on a model. So tell us more about that uh, when we think about uh, designing uh, clothes to be more size inclusive. So uh, walk us through how you teach this. Yes. So a lot of times we will look at the human body and the proportion and thinking about how is something that we're going to design in 2D. So it starts as a sketch. Um, and how is that going to look on a person? So drafting is really is what I specialize in. And it's really the architecture of the body uh, and being able to take a person's measurements and representing it on paper and then constantly going back from sketch to model, uh, to fabric, and molding it around the body in an effective way. Gianluca Russo is still with us. Can you respond to what Ken Lin has shared about um, the brands need to bring people uh, more behind the scenes and what it's like uh, to uh, be designing clothes to be more inclusive, having certain people in the room that have been excluded? Absolutely. Well, I think the reason education is such an important conversation here is that we can't expect the future of fashion to be inclusive if, if the designers of tomorrow aren't being taught to be so. And I think that's why fashion schools have such a responsibility here to really, you know, lead the charge and, and to take hold of this conversation. Um, and a large part of that is kind of bringing those people behind the scenes, because that's the only way you can authentically change the narrative is by allowing those stories to be told and allowing those voices to be heard there. Um, and of course, then, you know, bringing in people with experience as well. And I think that's the important thing um, is there are so many people who have a wealth of experience here, not only in, you know, design, but of course, in fashion marketing and, and all these different uh, playing fields here that are important and, and that play into each other. Um, but I think that the more that we bring people behind the scenes there in those conversations, and especially at fashion schools, it's going to open these kids' minds up to the possibilities that are there that previously were never shown. I think that's a huge part of the reason that we don't see size inclusive fashion today is because it was never even a possibility. A majority of fashion schools across the country offer no plus size education. They don't offer specific courses. There's not electives. There's possibilities if they want to pursue doing plus in their senior showcase or the senior collection, um, but it's not part of the curriculum in a majority of top fashion schools across the country. I think that's doing such a disservice there. Uh, but I think when you have people who understand this going behind the scenes and who are the ones educating and, and coming to consult and have these conversations, I think these students are going to start to see that there is more than just potential here. This is really the future and they have to kind of get on board with that and be prepared for that or else they're kind of being set up for failure and set up for a world that hopefully is going to be very different from the one we have now. 
Again, you're hearing John Luca Russo, a fashion journalist. Uh, Kenlyn Jones is also here, assistant professor, uh, again, uh, at a fashion school in Massachusetts. But I want to thank Alex Waldman for joining us, co-founder of Universal Standard, again, a women's clothing brand that is the most size inclusive brand in the world. Alex, a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you for your time today. It was an absolute pleasure. We're going to continue talking about this after the break. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking about size inclusivity on the show today, how fashion brands approach larger sizes, often relegating them to the plus size section. Do you still shop in stores or are you discouraged by the lack of options? You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. John Luca Russo here with us, a fashion journalist, author of the forthcoming book, Power of Plus, and Kenlyn Jones, assistant professor at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Uh, so I wanted to talk about, when we think about uh, sustainable fashion and, and fast fashion, John Luca, we talked about this briefly, all have become part of the conversation, but is it hard to have um, size inclusivity in fast fashion? Uh, you know, is it is it able to, to coexist? And, and why is this? I actually think size inclusivity is much easier in fast fashion, which is why so many plus size people um, have to shop fast fashion and why it's so prevalent throughout the community. And I think, of course, it's because of the low cost. They're able to produce a wider spectrum of clothing there. Um, and of course, the unfair conditions and all of that that goes on behind the scenes when it comes to fast fashion. But I think because of the low investment that's made as opposed to sustainable fashion, um, that's why they really are able to produce such a wide spectrum. And I I think also fast fashion is able to provide trending clothing and clothing that is very now and you can't find that in sustainable per se um, there is a rising sustainable market that caters to size inclusivity and we're seeing m many more brands kind of come on that but i think at the same time you know su sustainable fashion is of course going to be more expensive there's going to be less variety there there's going to be less styles and the majority of those styles are not going to be the trendy fashion we're seeing right now, whereas fast fashion is offering that at a very cheap price in an extended size range to this customer, something they've never had before. And so really, in a lot of ways, this woman is looking at their options and saying, well, my only option if I want to dress in what my style, my aesthetic is, is to shop fast fashion. And that's unfortunately the case because, you know, contrary to the straight size world, there's not a spectrum or a variety of styles available in plus sizes yet. It really is still so limited. And fast fashion is kind of the only area that's offering this trendy clothing, this clothing that really fits now, that feels very of the moment, that's very, you know, fashion week driven. Um, whereas sustainable fashion is it's different and it's not appealing to a lot of people and it's also more expensive and and a lot of people just don't want to invest in that money it's a, it's a mindset a mind uh set change and i think that's a, a huge problem as well so i think fast fashion is much more inclusive than sustainable fashion and not necessarily because like that's a great thing but just because that's where we're at right now as designers continue to change and see the benefit there but i don't think the sustainable plus size customer is as established as the one for fast fashion is mm. kenlyn jones how are you talking about sustainability and size inclusivity in your classroom well we kind of look at sustainability and plus size inclusion uh as part of a closed loop. Uh, while I do understand what John, uh, John Luger is saying, um, you know, there are ways to create great looks for all that are still sustainable. Um, so talking to students about uh, low waste cutting and uh, organic fabrics, and maybe that means that there won't be as many options available as far as manufacturing, let's say 20,000 units, maybe you only manufacture 2,000 units, uh, 
But we believe that sustainability uh, is, is very important in the fashion industry and in fashion education. I want to take a quick call. Uh, Virginia is calling in from Bridgeport. Virginia, we just have a couple of minutes. What did you want to share with us? Hi. So my name is Virginia. I um, run a shop in Bridgeport, and we're a secondhand um, fashion kind of place. So we, I was telling on the phone before, I started this because I couldn't find anything my size, like, ever, especially when it comes to, like, trying to shop secondhand, trying to shop vintage. And, like, through starting this work in the community and having other people come to our shop looking for this, like, I realized how big the emotional toll is on people for not finding clothes, for not finding what they want to wear even. So, like, having to come to our space and be shocked and cry and just be in absolute, like, shock that they can find things, that was very eye-opening because I thought it was an individual experience and, like, your, you know, the way that you're thought to believe about this, but that has been changing. And like, my goal is to change this. Like my goal is to, through our work, make this more accessible and try to find that community to, you know, be, to offer that and offer those options. And it's, it's been incredible to find out how much there's a gap and how much work there is to be done to right. bridge that. And Virginia, tell us the name of your shop before we let you go. Yeah, it's called Witch Bitch Thrift, and we're in Bridgeport. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Virginia, for, for calling in and sharing that with us. Again, we just have a, a few minutes left, uh, Jean-Luc. Uh, we, we wanted to ask you, you know, is this a problem when we think about men's fashion? Absolutely. I think it's even more of a problem than in the women's wear space, and, and simply because it hasn't been tackled at, at such extensive um, rates. And I think women's wear in the plus division and size inclusivity has been developing over so long, right? There's been decades of work that's being done. And of course, there's still so far to go, but there's kind of this community behind it now that's really propelling that momentum. I don't think the same is similar in men's wear. I think it's actually very different. I don't think that community has been established yet. Because of that, brands aren't necessarily so sure that that customer is there, even though statistically that customer is there. I believe the statistic is that the average man wears a size 38, 40 pant, which is considered plus size. A majority of brands will cap out at a size 36, 38 pant. So they're capping out right before they hit the average. And that's a majority of mass retailers and designers and all of that. Um, and so I think it's a brand new space. It's one that's starting to be tackled. I think we're seeing new models, you know, IMG models, which is one of the biggest modeling agencies in the world, has really kind of led the charge here. We're seeing more and more people kind of enter the conversation, but it's at a much slower pace. I think women's wear led the way and has kind of paved the path. But now we really need to establish that community to prove to brands because unfortunately, brands, as we've seen in the women's wear space, are not going to take this leap until the data is clear and until ultimately they know that they can make money. So right now it's about proving that this community is there. I think in men's wear, there's different issues as well. I don't think it's just necessarily knowledge and, and knowing what's out there. I think there's a lot attached to this idea that fashion is for women only and that men shouldn't care about it. And, and thus a lot of men don't and they're just like, I'll wear whatever, it's fine. Um, so I think there's other issues that are involved here as well. But the plus size men's wear market is far beyond the women's and the conversation is starting, but it's going to take a while before we see some significant progress. Hmm. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk about this. And as you mentioned, a lot of different issues when we think about size inclusivity and how uh, fashion uh, the brands as well as fashion world will respond to this. Uh, Jean-Luca Russo, again, is a fashion journalist, author of Power of Plus, coming out in August, all about the plus size uh, movement. Uh, Jean-Luca, a pleasure to hear from you. Thank you so much for your perspective today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And Kenlyn Jones was here, assistant professor at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. Kenlyn, thank you for sharing what you're teaching and for the work that you do. Thanks for having me. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, Test Terrible produced today's show. Katie Pellico was on the phones today. Thank you so much for calling in and engaging with us. And apologies if we didn't have enough time to take all of your calls. We'll be back on Monday. Have a great weekend. 